selected um, condition which is quite close to me. I had another work. I was still doing a lot of work. Uh, and so the title says a master of disguise, but probably you can think about Wilson's disease, or you should rather, as a, a disease you cannot afford to miss. Of course, we have a lot of conditions we cannot afford to miss, uh, but this kind of ever-growing list, and I'll sort of um, make a case, because recognition of the condition is difficult, but I'll make a case how to both recognize and diagnose and then eventually treat that. Oops, how do I advance? Hold on. Oh, sorry. So it, this is a genetic disorder. Uh, it's, it's autosomal recessive condition. That means that so there are biallelic mutations, and there is only only gene uh, linked to Wilson disease, which is ATP7B, which is the copper uh, not by it's copper transporter. Uh, it was actually discovered relatively quickly after Menke's disease gene, which is ATP7A. So Menke's is a different disorder of copper metabolism, which is copper deficiency. And so the homology between ATP7A and 7 b led to discovery of multiple mutations of this gene. Uh, and this condition is actually uh, characterized by varying combinations of uh, liver, neurological, and psychiatric manifestations, which kind of makes very difficult to diagnose these, pa these patients on a timely, in a timely fashion because, again, they may see different specialists and they do not realize what we are dealing with. We used to say it's fatally left untreated, even though maybe this needs to be revised um, because there are, as we know, the genetics now, there's discovery of few, or identification of few patients, even there are 70s and 80s, who had mild disease and were mis been misdiagnosed as essential tremor or Parkinson's disease. But the mutation showed um, uh, mutations in ATP7B. But I mean, it's probably better in a kind of in your framework of reference to think that this is really something what you know is fatal, or very devastating in the vast majority of patients. And again, life, life lifelong therapy is needed. Uh, hopefully, we'll have enough time to get through the whole talk. Uh, of course, liver transplant is uh, curative. And also, we are working now on a gene therapy, so I'm uh, working with the two companies as a part of that sort of research team. So, so that will be potentially curative. Um, and the average age of diagnosis is about 15, 20 years. So what does ATP7B, what does it do? It will, and you probably have heard the term cerebroplasmin, which is the copper binding protein. And uh, normally, we sort of recycle copper through the bile and then feces stool. But here, this is kind of accumulation of copper and actually also free copper because copper can be bound, uh, which is non-toxic, but kind of really then overwhelms the system. And, you know, we don't know why, but typical age of uh, presentation is about 15 to 20 years, so second decade typically. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, that's really, this is, you know, mostly the patients are born like this, but it just takes a while to really accumulate enough copper. I thought it would be useful to, again, as I said, very briefly give you sort of a snapshot of what is a normal cup of metabolism. Just you, we have a you know, regular diet. We about eat about one milligram of copper per day. That sort of, of course, depends on the diet, but most diets would have that about one milligram per day. And so we kind of need about a quarter of this. So three quarters need to be excreted. And again, what the uh, ATP7B, what is it doing? Is it very loading onto the seroplasmin? So again, you think about the bound copper, and seroplasmin is the main copper binding protein, is actually safe to transport. So it's really the free copper, which is toxic. But under normal circumstances, we have you know, some free copper because in copper is a, a coenzyme, uh, it is very cofactor for many enzymes. So, you know, of course, yeah, I've also done a lot of work in copper deficiency, which probably would deserve different talk. So I kind of always thought about my work as a Dr. Drake and Mr. Hyde. You know, there are patients we try to remove excessive copper in Wilson's disease, but I have also patients who have a copper deficiency, which is a different condition. Uh, but anyway, so normally we would excrete this in a, in a stool, as I said, under normal homeostasis of copper. So as I said, genetics is... Uh, it's a recessive condition, so that means that typically, you know, parents are unaffected. You know, there are a few clusters, you know, Sardinia, uh, there are a few uh, communities in Costa Rica, 
uh, where there is a lot of sort of, so there's a pseudo autosomal dominant uh, when basically has a lot of prevalence, but typically, you know, there is no family history to speak of, which is you know, true for many recessive conditions. Uh, the consanguinity risk can be seen, even though this is relatively common, because the free car carrier frequency is about 1 in 90, 1 in 100. Actually, you know, there was um, uh, my friend and colleague uh, Oliver Bandman from she Sheffield in the UK thought would be much higher, which kind of really uh, begs the question, are we, are we diagnosing all the patients? And again, there are some thoughts that we are missing maybe two-thirds of these patients, if you recall. Uh, we, we kind of thought about it as a fatal disease, but maybe there is a, a subset of patients who have relatively uh, subclinical disease. Again, when you think about, uh, about the physiology, ATP7B, it's a loss of function. And so it's known from uh, many neurometabolic conditions that uh, some of these enzymes may have a partial function preserved. So then we have this delayed, late onset adult atypical atypical core. So this is our pedigree, kind of, you know, this is a sort of, you know, fictional pedigree, uh, but uh, actually it was for different condition, but I thought that uh, would be very telling because obviously it's a prototypical recessive condition, which basically means that uh, there is um, a 25, uh, you know, risk, uh, one, one in four risk for each sibling, which is also important because uh, I will also talk about management, and uh, it is really your duty as a treating physician to either uh, uh, screen all the siblings uh, or at least make sure they are screened. And also then, of course, you know, you need to also know if things get more complicated uh, because they also there are carriers, of course, so the both parents would be by definition carrier. Carriers are normal, so there is no e evidence for any kind of increased risk for uh, any conditions. Now we're recognizing that some of these neurometabolic conditions, the carriers may not be completely off the hook. Again, um, if you're following the genetics of Parkinson's disease, which again, you know, would be talked probably in a few, I guess, weeks, because we do, I do, this is my third grand analysis since I came here, so it's kind of several per year, so genetics of Parkinson's disease is coming soon. So we know that these patients may be affected, uh, this carrier may be affected by Wilson's disease. They may have some uh, a borderline copper abnormalities in a lab work, but they are otherwise healthy or unaffected. So, as I said, uh, it's a master of disguise, as my title said, and um, there are sort of, it's really the clinical recognition is difficult. You know, I would, I always say, if you do not think about it, you won't diagnose that. So, 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 and again, I will make a case for from a neurological presentation. Of course, I won't talk much about hepatic almost at all. Uh, I will uh, slightly touch upon psychiatry because it is very important, and we may see patients when we go to, I think it's second floor, correct? Second, I think it's second floor, whatever is the psychiatry uh, department. Uh, uh, so, these patients may present with the psychiatric symptoms, purely psychiatric symptoms. But again, I will, the focus of the talk is, of course, neurological presentation. There is also pre-symptomatic. Again, uh, you can detect them by active screening of unaffected siblings. I had a few patients, I recall two or three patients under my care at the previous institution who were, diagnosed, who were sent to me by ophthalmologists. They would go for the routine ophthalmologic examination and the smart, actually sometimes even optometrists would notice uh, Kaiser Fleischer rings, and of course, that led to the diagnosis of Wilson's disease. I'll talk about the role of uh, ophthalmological examination uh, in a few minutes. So, this is sort of a kind of a outline of the uh, different uh, frequency of different phenotypes. Some of them, you know, and there, are, there is a lot of variability, and it kind of depends who sees this patient. So, of course, I focus on, you know, neurological symptoms, even though as a geneticist, I also, you know, of course, I don't treat liver, but I make sure they are seen by. Hepatologist, but about, you know, you know, so really the major presentations again would be hepatic and uh, neurological. It's important to say that many patients who have a neurological presentation have not really clinical liver disease, which makes it more difficult. Of course, if they have a coexisting liver and a break, or you know, the old term for the, if we probably recall, the old term for Wilson disease is a uh, hepatolenticular degeneration which basically kind of really talks about uh, main areas of liver and basically basal ganglia. Uh, there are few, it's quite interesting how, uh, kind of, as you see, I was thinking how to denote uh, 
<laughs> psychiatric versus neurological. So I went for the whole brain, even though I like to be holistic also in neurology, but I gave psychiatry the whole brain as an organ. And I showed us as a sort of neurons, even though I'm not sure this is correct, but I'll keep it that way. There are a few very rare uh, presentations which are not diagnosable, like Fanconi syndrome or some, some type of bone disease, which, you know, it's so rare, I've never seen them. And I, I don't, I'll just mention them that you may sometimes see this uh, in a combination. So don't be, you know, doesn't mean that you can exclude Wilson's disease if, let's say, somebody has a Fanconi syndrome. So, you know, for our residents, uh, actually, you probably still remember something from your internship and, uh, you know, the some of us who are in practice in neurology longer time probably can afford to uh, forget what is Fanconi syndrome is. The geneticists have to kind of keep it, uh, kind of uh, at least I uh, have an idea what I'm talking about. Anyway, so the neurological presentation is very variable and very protein. Thus uh, was the title of a uh, great imitator or master of disguise. Uh, you see that so it's about like one third of patients, even though the the, the, the estimates vary up to 75%. Again, kind of really depends who sees these patients and how thorough this examination is, because sometimes this patient may have very subtle symptoms, and again, you have to really be well, you know, uh, versed in the neurological examination to, to detect those. So clearly, what is important? This is a treatable condition. That, that's why I said this is a, if this is you cannot afford to miss because it's highly treatable. Actually, I had a lot of um, you know patients who are basically were the devast look like devastated, and now they are normal, nearly normal. But the diverse clinical presentation makes a quite challenge in the diagnosis of this disease. Initial misdiagnosis is common. You know, really, the diagnosis is typically delayed up to three years, you know, most, most, most data would show about 12 months, one year. Uh, and uh, obviously the sooner the treatment starts, the better outcomes are. And inversely, more you, you, you wait with the correct, correct treatment, more neurological disability accrues, and then it can be irreversible. We also go through imaging to show you how destructive this condition can be, you know, in, on, in the brain. So traditionally, we are talking about four subtypes. I'm not a big fan of this, of course, it's very important, but uh, basically uh, you see there are four subtypes. You can read for yourself. Dystonic is probably the worst uh, in terms of um, 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 presentation, you know, because it's secondary dystonia. Tremor is the best in quotes, actually, so I would sort of make air quotes. It's sometimes called pseudosclerotic tremor. I'll show some videos soon. Uh, and uh, but many times they kind of merge together. Uh, typically, you know, solitary neurological symptom herald the onset of disease, and sometimes you know they they have been sometimes you know I had a few you know uh, patients who were by good colleagues of mine really respect you know respected colleagues who were basically dismissed as a psychogenic and really led to devastation. So uh, what I'm So they, it's, it's, you know, again, you have to think about it. You have to be on your toes all the time. The advanced stages may also have, a, you know, hyperkinetic components, atetosis, myoclonus, chorea. Sometimes you can see pyramidal signs, ataxia, and, you know, advanced cases, ab eye movement abnormalities. But uh, typically would be uh, dysarthria, as a matter of fact, is probably the most common presenting symptoms, slurring words. And you know tremor plus minus Parkinsonian features, so, so mostly hypokinetic. But again, especially children can have a, a really sometimes opposite chorea or hyperkinetic uh, clinical phenomenology. So this is the uh, 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 um, sort of a, a, a summary of several studies uh, looking at the sort of a presenting symptom and you know and distribution. Uh, the if you look at the so if you look at the age of onset again, so for the neurological would be sort of young teenagers, or sorry, no, teenagers and young adults. So teenagers and young adults. So many times these patients are basically students, uh, high school or you know first year of college. So you probably may see somebody who came to your well and you know have problems. Many times you know it's thought to be stress, or sometimes they are thought to be on drugs. Uh, but also many times the school performance goes down, so these you know psychiatric symptoms can be more. Recognized, uh, but if you see diagnostic delay, which is the line number three, uh, is you know basically it's in a month. So so the, the, the it's in a month. So it's about a year. It's not 12 years. It's 12 months. 
So those are kind of really quote unquote good numbers, you know, again the sooner the better. But sometimes, you know, this can go unrecognized for several years. Again, this artery, if you look at it, was most common abnormal gait, tremor again, but some patients don't have a tremor. And the seizures can sometimes happen, you know, especially in the act, so those are rare, but it tells you about a lot of uh, um, um, active disease. Now, some of these uh, uh, phenotypes are described as ataxic, even though it's not a true ataxia per se, it's kind of more pseudo ataxia. And I'll show you some videos, but again, so you see the pole points of this table is that how pleiotrophic, how pleomorphic, how, how protein the uh, presentation actually is. So again, as I mentioned, delayed recognition of the disease uh, can lead to the progressive worsening, which can be irreversible, which then, of course, influences the overall prognosis and the outcomes. Uh, Again, the best outcomes were uh, noticed when the diagnosis was established very quickly, appropriate below six months. So it really, I mean, of course, it's not a, it's not a stroke type of emergency, uh, so it's a little bit different dynamics, but it's not a chronic disease per se. So, you know, your window of opportunity is relatively limited. And again, it can make a big difference because, you know, one of these patients may achieve uh, you know, I have patients who can mute in a wheelchair, and now they are more or less normal. They have maybe some a little bit sort of, you know, frontal lobe, you know, minor issues, but they are really functioning. They are really having also quite decent job. Actually, I had a two doctors, you know, who were, you know, really practicing without any problems. Uh, so, you know, outcomes can be, you know, that's why it's so important because, again, it's really, you know, if you lose the battle, if you don't diagnose it on time, it's properly over again, as, as I'll show you later. So I mentioned tremor. So it is you know, very common. Again, tremor is quote unquote sometimes best prognostic factor because they tend to be better. But tremor can be, you know, of course, you know, knowing knowing the movement disorder so examination can be rest, but most mostly it's action and postural tremor. Um, action tremor is really what's disabling, which is true for any kind of you know tremor syndromes. There is also a very typical, I show you in a minute, wing beating tremor, which is sort of a prototypical, even though it's rare. So, you know, these patients may really uh, be diagnosed uh, as a uh, essential tremor. Again, I cannot mention any names. Uh, in my practice so far, I've seen probably 300 patients, maybe 250 of Michigan and Vanderbilt together. Uh, so, you know, it's, really, it's, it's an anomaly. You probably will see a few patients, but I've seen also, you know, patients, you know, misdiagnosed by excellent neurologists. Again, so I'm trying to emphasize that you have to be on your toes all the time. Now, I, I don't mean to say that everybody has Wilson's disease, but uh, it's better to exclude it rather than miss it. Anyway, so so as I mentioned, sometimes can be undistinguishable undist from uh, essential tremor, uh, and you know, usually would be ours, but also could be midline tremor, head and trunk. And again, some studies which suggest that sclerotic tremor have a better outcomes, but of course, many times can be medically refractory. You may need to do some surgeries. You know, of course, you know our division um, with Dr. Holiday and myself and and um, Laura Dixon. We of course do a lot of surgeries, so this is something also you can you know the DVS surgeries. I mean, so this is something what can be treated. You know, because this can be medically refractory. So. Let me show you. Um, so you, you saw no, head tremor. You see some dystonia of feet. You see, so it's kind of going fast. I can go back, but it, but, it, but when it tries to basically activate his arms, you see this. Um, I mean, you would say. I mean, you know, I, I don't think I, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody says this is functional. Of course, you know. So, but this is this is this wing beating tremor. And, uh, you know, so any kind of task is absolutely impossible. I mean, you know, this is as disabling as it gets. Uh, so, so this is the example. We don't have to sort of see more. Basically, we had a surgery when, when it was okay. I just, you know, we don't have to see that because, again, focus is the, you know, um, a movement phenomenology, you know, so the, the, the phenotype. And again, this is the tremor, uh, which uh, you, if you see that, you probably won't miss. You will never re uh, miss it. So let me actually, this is a. Let me go to other, yeah. So this is another example of tremor. Uh, so these are uh, all these. Um, uh, so this is actually uh, for Dr. Klonowska, Professor Klonowska from Poland, who has also large 
cohort of patients. And again, so give you some ideas that it doesn't have to be this sort of, uh, you know, can be sort of more, um, you know, you would think about sort of more essential tremor. Uh, uh, you know, we could argue it's some, 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 uh, some. Um, so this this doesn't have to be that sort of dramatic. And so you see this position, you know, basically. So I see the delay for the right arm. So you should really, when, when you do examination, wait. And now actually, it's getting sort of sorry. Those are old videos, so its quality is not it's not HD, but I still think it's in a good to show show and see that it's sometimes it's kind of delayed. And so this. Uh, Poster holding the arms, you know, in front of the chest, not to kind of make sure they don't lock it, they don't touch the chest. Uh, they can provoke, so as you have to wait, you know, up to 15 uh, seconds. So if you kind of rush, you may sort of miss it. But so, so tell, telling you that tremor can be sort of this very typical wing beating, which is unforgettable. And there are very few conditions which can do that, but also can be sort of more garden variety tremor. I will skip this. So this is actually tremor of the uh, of, of the legs, but can, we can maybe just for the sake of time going to the second uh, big area, which is dystonia, which is actually very common as well. And this is probably the worst. So this is actually a prototypical scenario of secondary dystonia. So you, you know, again, the idiopathic dystonias, which are basically mostly genetics. And again, you know, if you think about dystonia, it can be focal, segmental, multifocal, or generalized dystonia. And the fo focal forms can, again, mimic other conditions, torticollis, uh, uh, right script, but very typical, very typical. If, again, if, if there is one phenotype or one phenomenology, you will remember, for, you know, as a for tremor would be the wing beating tremor. So for the dystonia would be this uh, rhizus sardonicus, which is kind of this forced, uh, kind of almost exaggerated smile, you know, so that was in the scrub with the tetanus, but, you know, also it can be see the secondary dystonias, and they are extremely disabling, they are catastrophic, catastrophic tremor, uh, dystonias in terms of the speech and swallowing. So, really, craniofacial region is probably, that's what I really always watch and uh, very nervous when my patients have a potential worsening to make sure that the speech and swallowing is... Uh, not getting catastrophically impaired. Some of these patients are basically mute. I'll show you some videos uh, and some does need a having feeding tube. Uh, so again, dystonia is a typical for the kind of secondary dystonia for the structural lesions, which is also important for us maybe from DBS point of view. I, I did few surgeries. Well, you know, you know, I'm not surgeon, but I mean, I indicated about, about three surgeries, um, a DBS with a GPI placement, and the, the data is very... Uh, Mixed and again, you know, so again, because in these secondary dystonias uh, tend to have a relatively less uh, favorable outcome for deep brain stimulation, but again, they are also sometimes more fixed. I'll show, show you videos, which is not case, but again, um, uh, before we get to the videos, again, I would consider the presence of dystonia as a negative prognostic factor, and again, this is probably the most resistant. Uh, so you kind of really see if you look at the sort of, uh, we will see some more MRIs, but look at the area of basal ganglia. So, you know, it's a really, uh, you know, abnormal signal, basically, you know, putamen. So kind of, you know, it's kind of kind of not surprising, quote unquote, that these patients have dystonias, even though you know, I would point out that the correlation between MRI and clinical symptoms phenotype is not there at all. All right, so let's see this gentleman. So, I, so this is uh, something, so typically primary dystonias or idiopathic dystonias tend to have a much more hyperkinetic um, and the uh, secondary dystonias tend to be more static. So this is exactly the opposite. So this patient has, you know, very kind of hyperkinetic movements. Uh, you see dystonic posturing of the neck, uh, both arms, feet. He's able to walk with the, with the but you see dystonic posturing of both feet, trunk is also so. This is pretty significant uh, uh, dystonia, and uh, again, I would say that given his hyperkinetic component, uh, this can have a relatively good outcome, you know, so again, relatively speaking. So again, he's able to work with a, and let's watch, let's watch the second half of the video, which is basically against any tasks. And so this is after, you know, this is um, after tr some treatment, so, you know, see some improvement, even though it's still really, uh, getting a lot of uh, this sort of, uh, you know, hypercritic movement, so this is still very active, but uh, maybe some improvement of gait. So let's kind of stop it here. 
Now, let me show you this. Actually, this is more typical this story, unfortunately. So this is, you know, and so, she's unfortunately mute. So I see this rise. So see that, you know, again, it's not HD, but if you look, it's all, it's just platysma activation. And if you see that sort of quote unquote smile, this is the rise, you know, uh, Sardonicus. And um, so it's kind of this orofacial dystonia. So this gentleman, and this video looks like it's not moving, but actually it's playing. So obviously he has very static. So this is more common. Let's look at his left arm, left, left hand. Well, there is, a, there is a dystonia in both ends, but of course, left one is much more affected. And so you see, I mean, there is some movements by comparing to previous gentlemen. So this is kind of more typical. For, so again, now video stopped, but it was playing and was hardly any movement. So this is more typical for these secondary dystonias. Uh, this one, she has, this one is an atria, so actually, again, there is no sound, but she's trying to talk, she's trying to speak, and basically, they are, so she's kind of voicing, so typically, cognition can be normal, uh, she's saying something is poor, she's actually, she's trying to do uh, uh, lip, uh, lip reading, I don't know what she's saying, but obviously, she's, you know, again, there is no sound, but there is no sound, she's um, practically mute, so this, uh, so this is something where these patients are actually an artric and can be very, again, very disabling. Anyway, so uh, kind of really going back to the recapitulation before we go to, to diagnosis. Uh, so first, we have to have a clinical symptoms to think about it again. So again, so we talk about hepatic. I didn't talk much about liver, and it, you know, obviously this is you know, but in elevated transaminases, steatosis, cirrhosis, or acute liver failure. There's a few patients who present with the fulminant liver failure from seemingly good health. But these patients not, may not have any kind of neurological symptoms. Actually, these patients may have then secondary neurological symptoms from the uh, hepatic encephalopathy, but again, they may have a pure, but again, we are focusing on a neurological as I reviewed. Let me go back to psychiatry. Uh, again, I've, I don't think I've ever seen, quote unquote, a pure psychiatric presentation, uh, And but these patients get presented with from psychosis, depression, uh, uh, anxiety, you know, so I, I definitely always, when I see patients with a new sort of psychosis, especially younger patients, you know, I always screen for Wilson's disease, which we should do it also when we go to our psychiatric hospital or you know department um, my favorite story which is not mine this is I'm so this is second hand but with Dr. F uh, Peter Ferenczi he's an Austrian uh, hepatologist and a very prominent um, uh, figure in a uh, European uh, Wilson disease sort of uh, landscape by the way I have quite a few good colleagues working together uh, who are hepatologists they always, they always make fun of me that I have no business being in a you know Wilson disease um, uh, sort of um, landscape because uh, you know this is a liver disease, which is kind of true. But so brain is kind of a collateral damage, if you will. Uh, but, um, but but liver is the main. But, but anyway, so um, this so this there's a story of psychiatric patient in Austria who was in a long term psychiatric facility. So you know in Europe they still have those long term facilities. And he was basically there, and you no, know, they have they have, it's not the prison. So you know they get Google and. Um, you know, and internet and so on. So, so the gentleman was Googling his symptoms and, and he sort of kind of called Dr. Ferenczi, I think I have a Wilson's disease. He was about 10 years, you know, treated by psychiatrist. And he said, I think I have a Wilson's disease. And um, to make a long story short, he did, he did indeed uh, <laughs> have had a Wilson's disease. So again, this is kind of rare, but again, it's mostly psychosis. We'll talk about ophthalmology mostly for the diagnostic purposes. And again, we, you know, renals are, in my opinion, undiagnosable. And I don't, you know, nobody suggests to screen patients with, a, you know, I mean, you know, Fanconi syndrome, you know, but, you know, sometimes can be very rare. And again, especially if you have a absence of any kind of ophthalmologic, psychiatric, hepatic or neurological symptoms, you are really, it's almost impossible to diagnose in a timely fashion, I think. Anyway, so we already talked. So when it's so so we, so we, when you have to think about um, Wilson disease, so for for the neurological symptoms, think about it when you have a new onset movement disorders of ankle etiology, particular dysarthria, drooling, tremor. So and so those are sort of typical the first symptoms. Again, drooling and dysarthria can be very very prominent. Again. There is one condition I would like to kind of think about, hemolytic anemia with the Coombs, you know, negative antibodies. So hemolytic anemia with liver disease and especially Coombs and negative antibodies. Again, kind of, you have to sometimes really remember internal medicine, which is in, but uh, that's a big clue. But again, for the our focus of neurological symptoms, these patients may not have any kind of uh, detectable liver disease, as I mentioned. And again, for the hepatologists, they have to do that when they have unexplained liver disease and they have a nice... Uh, 
algorithm so we are again focusing on these kind of new un otherwise unexplained or unclear theology of uh, this sort of typical uh, again this arthria and drooling probably would be very subtle things if you kind of think about it you know in young patients and you have high chance to diagnose this condition which you know i was lucky and privileged to do that and the outcomes are typically fantastic uh, anyway so diagnosis so again we'll go through details uh, but you have a screening so there are basically there are there are sort of screening methods uh, and then there are diagnostic methods uh, again I will go through details uh, so but again so you know we start with the screening and then you have a confirmatory diagnosis so uh, screening and of course you probably all do steroplasmin um, so typically less than 20 you know again I also give, gave this talk in Europe so I have also micromolar which, which I never remember by heart um, uh, and actually, I was supposed to talk, give this talk in Prague about a year ago, but of course, COVID kind of uh, changed that, so I'm happy to do it in Louisville. But anyway, so uh, even though it should be less than 20, less than 20 um, uh, usually these patients have a much lower values. Interesting, at Vanderbilt, everybody had 18. I was like, you know, it was like was non-random non number. Everybody had 18. And there are also two ways to, to diagnose, uh, to, to detect, to assay cerebroplasmine. There is a biochemical and immunological, uh, um, just kind of complicated uh, uh, sort of story. So it depends what they use. But again, this is a screening. Very important is, so, so basically copper, so cerebroplasmine also would reflect the copper. So, and if you have a copper deficiency, you know, you know, you would have a low cerebroplasmine because copper and cerebroplasmine typically go together. So Basically, one thing to remember that serum copper is essentially useless or they're not very useful. Uh, it's important also to notice that seroplasmin is acute phase reactant. And uh, that's, you know, so that's a common reason for false negative data. Additional uh, is es estrogen levels, especially women who are on a birth control, even though estrogen levels are sort of lower, you know, the amount is lower in the in current modern generation of birth control, but again, estrogens would elevate and, uh, and so be careful. So again, this is a screening. Of course, if somebody has a 40 seroplasmine, you don't have to do anything else, but you know, around this 18, 20, you should probably go further. Even though typically, um, uh, conditions, you know, it's less than five micrograms in deciliter is strongly suggestive of Wilson disease. There's only one condition uh, which is also can be mimicked, and that's aceroplasminemia, which is a nut. So basically, this is the this is actually the genetic condition when you know there's a gene, you know, you know, uh, I mean, uh, coding for seroplasmine is uh, mut mutated. But again, this is a cup. Sorry, but uh, aceroplasminemia is not a copper overload. It is actually iron overload. So again, uh, so those are actually iron overloads are interesting sort of uh, uh, or deposit the, the, the condition with the iron deposits are very interesting. So astroplasminemia can mimic by the labs, but again, you would have to see very strong signal in on MRI with the with the iron um, deposits. Now I mentioned that the carriers or heterozygotes, you know, for instance, parents of every patient are normal, but you know. They would have a sort of lowish cerebroplasmy. So sometimes you may have a, and you know, you probably would need a help. I mean, you know, uh, uh, if you, so this is something getting more advanced. If you have a, maybe, um, sometimes, you know, we have to kind of struggle if it's really um, carrier versus a sort of a mildly affected patient. So it can be difficult. Uh, but uh, again, so cerebroplasmy tends to be low, but below 18 or 20, I typically take further because this is again a very, it's 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 a, it's a screening test, and again, think about it. Estrogens and acute phase reactant can give you falsely negative, um, falsely negative data. Uh, so, kind of lame joke. So, the, on the right side is a Kaiser, and the other one is Fleischer. So, this is a joke by Dr. Brewer, who kind of, uh, but I still say it. It's you know. So, but basically, you see two different eyes, different irises, different colors. And uh, if you look at the sort of this sort of this uh, ring, so typically you can sort of see you can see it with a naked eye, and especially if you look at the uh, on the right side, my right side, um, the so it's kind of brown uh, sort of iris. So you can even with a sort of darker eye, you can see that as a sort of this uh, kind of uh, opaque. I'm not sure you can see my um, 
mark, you know, my, my mouse, but uh, it's kind of a sort of a kind of a nice, so the, this kind of brownish, brownish kind of ring. Uh, doesn't have to be always the full ring, so these patients have a full ring. Um, it sometimes can be 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock. Uh, there are patients who don't have a Kaiser Fascia ring, so I have to confess many times I don't even send patients to, if I if I diagnose this by other means, because Kaiser Fascia rings are completely asymptomatic. These patients may have also sunflower cataracts. Um, I saw that so the, um, Randy Brown is on, is on, you know, it was uh, I saw you know him, him so he's on. Uh, this presentation, so you know, if you do see the kind of you know, neuroophthalmology, you can see that, uh, you can see that. But again, so you, you should do sl uh, slit lamp uh, examination, but you can sometimes see the naked eye. So I was kind of eyeball. It doesn't have to be only with a, with a somebody who has a you know blue or you know pale eyes, blue iris, you know, but it's kind of more obvious. And with the decoupling, this goes away. So this is basically just extra copper in the descent membrane, and again, it's clinically asymptomatic. But it's very helpful for the diagnosis. Uh, so again, but the, the actual diagnosis is a laboratory based, which is kind of nice because obviously movement disorders, it's all based on the clinical symptoms. But here we have a very strong lab. Uh, but again, so we have a you have a you have a confirmatory test, and really 25 urine copper assay is to me the most um, most. Uh, I, I used it all the time, so uh, our nurses kind of also kind of know how to do that here. And I do it both for confirmation of diagnosis, but also also for the for the management of the patients. There is only one thing we don't really worry much about it. For somebody who has a advanced obstructive uh, biliary obstruction, you know, would have a high copper, you know, so that so there is again this is more for hepatology uh, field. They may have a false, they would have a high copper. But it's you know from the obstructive uh, biliary um, you know hep hep hepatopathy, uh, and we don't we don't typically see this, so we don't have to worry much about it. But again, typically you would do 24-hour urine collection, you know, and so again, if it's done properly, it has, the vessel has to be in copper-free, you know, sort of chemicals to really. Uh, and again, this is to me both diagnostic and so this this is not a screen. This is only diagnosis. This is actually yes or no. And so again, hundred micrograms is typically um, again you have those micromoles if you can remember that it's conventionally used. So normally it's below 30, 40. Uh, you know, typically would be so 20, 30 would be you no. Know, some some labs can say 40, but you know, again I think I would say that again, if you remember more than hundred micrograms per 24 hours is really uh, without any medications affecting copper metabolism uh, would be conventionally considered diagnostic Wilson's disease. Again, these intermediate values between 50 and 100 can be seen in this kind of gray zone for the carriers, and they may require further investigations. Uh, there is one important thing which is kind of coming, and it's actually NCC, it's a non um bound, or actually I like to call it free copper. You can calculate that. Uh, you basically, uh, then you obtain the whole, uh, you kind of um, seroplasmin and total copper in urine, uh, total copper in plasma. I'm sorry, so copper in plasma, which is otherwise not useful, but you know, and you and you multiply seroplasmin times three and subtract, but it's calculated. It's not very precise, especially if the seroplasmin is low. But uh, we are getting to the essays of um, really uh, free copper, which is 10 to 15 is normal micrograms per deciliter, and um, about 15 it would be Wilson's disease. It's just difficult to do. They do some microfiltration. So we also done some work, of course, you know, in terms of what's the best essay. But uh, this, you know, I used to send it to Utah, but it counts two, three weeks. Basically, I need to have it within 24 hours because it can drive my diagnostic and uh, and um, treatment decisions. So again, uh, the uh, if urine copper would be sort of you know very workable, very useful essay. Uh, so I already mentioned that. So again, this is the, actually the actual sort of uh, uh, again you can with free copper, you can uh, do that. So uh, from total plasma, and uh, so it's basically it, normally we think seroplasmin would um, uh, bound uh, six copper atoms. You know, so you can sort of do that. But it, this is really more. So you multiply by three. Uh, you see, and but again, I, it's sort of uh, it's difficult when the seroplasmin is low. It's not very precise, but you can sometimes do that. 
Genetic testing, of course, is uh, diagnostic. It's important, even we know so. In this older, some older studies show that sometimes these patients would have a um, 70, 80 percent detection rate. Again, you, it's a recessive condition, so you need to have a bi allelic, uh, you know, mutation. So these patients are typically compound heterozygotes unless there is some consanguinity. Uh, and also there are some promoter-based. Uh, um, uh, promoter-based uh, uh, mutations, so it can be difficult. And if, if, you, if there is any kind of, uh, if you have a patient with a test count, test comes positive with one allele, and the other allele was, wasn't uh, detected, you can think, you know, this patient is, is uh, heterozygous. So that, that, that is why I still re heavily rely on biochemical parameters. And again, copper, copper metabolism, copper homeostasis, again, 24-hour urine, is decisive. So actually, it's, sort of tr it's actually I would say that urine test would trump genetic testing. You know, if if, if it's not inconclusive, um, and it's also important if you look at the screening of families, unless you know family mutation or mutations, if it's two types, it doesn't really help you because then you cannot know, you don't know if you didn't detect it or the patient doesn't harbor the mutation. So we already talked about it. So again, so 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 it could be sort of lowering. So that's why I, I sort of again um, I don't do it routinely, and you know we actually have a it's, so it's kind of a, if I can diagnose it without genetic testing, and there is also no genotype phenotype correlation, so it doesn't really help me to manage the patient. That's that's why again, as I said a few times, heavily heavily rely on biochemical assays. The MRI can be helpful, you know. So this is actually so this is a. Uh, uh, typical patient on the on the right side, there is an arrow. It looks like the so panda phenomenon. You know the, uh, the white matter changes. You know around surrounding the red nucleus, but those are rare. But typically, you would see putamen. Those particles, you see the changes. You know, uh, on, and again, sometimes can be also almost like cavity in a very advanced disease. Again, as I said, there is no phenotype. Uh, uh, genotype. Ah, uh, sorry, there is no. Sorry, there is no correlation between MRI. You know, even though these patients were quite, quite disabled, but you know, you may have a patient who have a relatively unremarkable MRI and having severe symptoms. Um, but uh, so this is sort of examples of MRI. If it's see that many times, you know, good good um, a good uh, neuroradiologist may even suggest in their report that this may be Wilson's disease. But again, you have to still confirm it by biochemical means. So the treatment. Um, so again, this is this is basically why we talk about you know. So this is kind of a it's not an obscure disease. I mean, it's I you know, I call it zebra. So it's, this is not a unicorn, and, and so it's very you know, especially if you do movement disorders or have a busy practice, uh, you probably will see these patients uh, at some point. So it is not something for it's not daily, but again, and and I say that when I do my copper screening, uh, with the uh, detection of 24-hour urine. For the confirmational excluding diagnosis, I would say that uh, 90 percent plasmid tests are negative, which I think is a good number because again, I don't want to miss it. Of course, I don't do this indiscriminately. I don't order you know copper for everybody. That would be wrong. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, again, uh, this is something you, could, you have to think about. But anyway, the 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 goals of treatment, and again, if you, if you remember that, if you recall from the beginning, uh, it should be lifelong unless patient has a uh, unless patient would have a, um, the gene therapy is coming, you know, we have first trials, but really the liver transplant. And I'll talk about liver transplant a bit. Uh, and so you want to, you really want to re reverse copper overload and establish negative copper balance, uh, during which copper values are reduced to normal levels. Furthermore, you need to be careful not to overtreat. Actually, I, I did overtreat few patients, you know, um, myself. You know, I was was able to detect it very early. Because again, you can you can you can induce iatrogenic copper deficiency. So again, uh, you have to be very careful. You know, and again, the question: Do should you manage that? Um, you know, that's really up to you. But uh, I'll give you the guidelines. But again, you know, having help, and I'm here, of course, to help any time. Uh, but uh, again, so this is something in a kind of long term, long term uh, process. We are kind of looking at a sort of um, uh, survey with a. Also, this is association, and lovely patients don't have a good. Um, you know, I usually do cup, copper urine twice a year at least for the stable patients. So you need to really be on your on on watch for the potential copper deficiency. 
So there are three uh, medications uh, uh, approved by the FDA. Um, first two, uh, penicillamine and triantine are chelators. Zinc acetate works differently. I, for the record, I almost don't use penicillamine at all. Uh, I explained to you, and so the, one of the reasons is that um, we talk about it, how important it is to diagnose it in a timely fashion, but if, even if you diagnose and start treatment, you and the patient are not you know, off the hook. You are still not out of the woods because one of the common challenge is uh, paradoxical uh, worsening, and I'll talk about it in a minute, which is to me, you know, area of significant interest of mine, and I've seen, you know, catastrophes. Uh, so basically, when you do, uh, when you, so penicillamine and trientine are again chelators, so you're kind of mobilizing copper, and by the way, they don't cross, neither, neither of them cross blood-brain barrier, barrier, so you are really siphoning the copper out of the brain, and during that first time, you have this, you can have a spike of free copper, and you can have a paradoxical worsening. There are some other side effects from penicillamine, which can be, you know, sometimes can actually mimic also myasthenic syndrome. Uh, so it's kind of quite nasty drug to use long term, you know, really not suitable for pregnancy. Zinc works differently. Zinc is an um, inducer, actually, was discovered by treatment of um, sickle cell. So, you know, we talked about sickle cell patients in yesterday, other contexts, but zinc was actually used for that. And actually, basically, what it does, it would um, induce methyl things. I'll show you, I have a nice slide about it, and will prevent the absorption of copper from the gut, from the GI system. But to achieve negative copper balance, it takes about three months. So I don't advocate using a high dose of zinc in acute phase. Some authorities do. I'm not necessarily saying I'm authority here, but anyway, it just takes too long. So triantine and penicillamine work fast, uh, but again, you have to really gradually increase the dose, and you have to be on a, on a watch for paradoxical worsening. So uh, here, the copper is, so basically what happens is when you use chelator agents, especially penicillamine, you would uh, mobilize the copper and you would then have a much higher urine copper. So, you know, it goes from maybe over 100 up to over 1,000. So basically, so it's, you know, so really you have to, sometimes they were, they were using a penicillamine challenge. We don't do that anymore. Actually, it's not even valid validated in an adult patient with the neurological symptoms. So I don't do penicillamine challenge. But basically, you, know, you should be able to get a lot of copper out through the, through the urine. Again, if you recall, normal route is through the bile, but so this would kind of really flush out copper through the urine, and you basically should have these values um, slightly lower for triantine. Uh, but so you know that patient is a taking the medication and b the medication is working. So we can also really uh, monitor uh, compliance for these patients. And again, if you and if you have less than 200 on therapy, it's either non-compliant or you can overtreat. So it can be very very complicated. So but you know, I usually do it at least you know at the beginning of every few weeks, but on a well-established patient about every six months. As I mentioned, zinc works a bit differently, and uh, and so methylothanes are sort of uh, copper bind, uh, metal bind, not copper metal metal binding uh, proteins in a, in a, in a, in a intestinal cells. The zinc induces them most effectively, but they have the highest uh, highest affinity towards copper. So basically, you are increasing the number of um, methylothanes uh, by exposure to zinc. And then when you eat food with the copper, of course our food has a copper, uh, the copper goes into enterocyte, but gets stuck, um, but, but, uh, irreversibly bound to methylothane, and you know we have a, a turnover of cells in enterocytes, and you basically shed that copper, which never gets into the bloodstream. It basically gets stuck in the enterocyte, and then that into the stool, so that way you kind of you blocking the copper absorption. But again, it takes about three months, not, not weeks, but three months to achieve a negative copper balance. But this is fantastic treatment for the maintenance, uh, which I use many, 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 many times, or for somebody who has, you know, who is asymptomatic. So, you know, copper uh, uh, can be very well controlled by zinc and happens to be relatively cheap. Uh, so I mentioned, so I mentioned this uh, paradoxical worsening. And so this is the, this is actually, Getzken, you know, he was a young, 
uh, law student. He was he was from Mexico City. He was 25, and so this is old uh, CAT scan, but I keep it. Uh, so he was one of my first patients, and basically, you know, again, I'm not sure you see my uh, mouse. I'm not sure you can see that, but uh, basically, he, he he had a cavities. You know, his uh, his uh, Striat tumor was basically basically one big cavity and unfortunately died. He was devastated. And so this what you think is happening is that when you start to mobilize the copper, you have a up, up you have a spike of the free copper. I was I have this uh analogy. Imagine you are you inherited a cottage uh or house in in a in a country, countryside. Nobody was there for five years, and you think maybe there is some nice, you know, memo, you know, nice uh you know, maybe some forgotten Picasso or even Da Vinci in, uh, in, the, in the attic. Nobody was in the attic five years. And the dust kind of really accumulated, you know, in the attic. So you open the attic and start to walk around looking for your Picasso or maybe, you know, Da Vinci. Uh, and thinking that you can retire from neurology like, after you sell it. And you start walking around and you steer the, you steer the dust up, you know. So you have this dust you probably can sneeze and cough. And that's the idea that you basically, when you start chelating agents, you are mobilizing this copper and you have this up spike of free copper. And when you have that, it basically gets more into the brain and really then ends up, you know, really liquidifying the basal ganglia. And that's really not good. So, um, so this is kind of getting more complicated. So this is also about our work with Alexion. So there's a new medication which can basically showing that uh, Controlling the free copper, uh, you know, uh, co controlling the tight control free copper leads to better outcomes. So there is new medication, tetrathiomolybdenate. I won't talk much about it or on the low because it's not approved yet. Uh, but so basically, so so medication which can control free copper can prevent neurological neurological worsening. And again, Alexi, you know, the tetrathiomolybdenate, which also was part of the trial in 1999. Uh, in 2001, I mean, uh, kind of dates me, uh, but I was 22 when I finished medical school, so that's that's the reason for that. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, kind of this is kind of reminiscing about my uh, beginning of Wilson disease work, but again, so this new medication may control uh, free copper tightly, and you you won't have this parad paradoxical worsening. Anyway, so this is the same thing. So kind of getting to the so um, I want to. Got to be, have some minutes uh, for, for questions. So I mentioned gene therapy a few times. Uh, again, I'm sort of part of the two trials. And liver transplant for neurological manifestation. Actually, we had also editorial editorial written um, uh, a year ago in neurology. We don't recommend it. It's going kind to of, that can really deserve the whole talk for the whole hour. We don't like to do that. But again, liver transplant can be curative, and it could, should really restore. Copper homeostasis very quickly, you know, assuming that you have a healthy liver with a normal ATP7 being, you know, gene or protein. And let me, so conclusion is a great imitator. If you don't think about it, you will miss it. If you, if you think about it, you know, it has a relatively straightforward diagnostic sort of cascade. There are some sort of pitfalls, but, you know, you can get a help. And delay in therapy can, you know, uh, delays in therapy can have a devastating consequences, but again, if you start medication early and don't have a paradoxical worsening, you, you, you may have good outcomes. And again, you know, we'll have probably talk in a few years when we have new medications approved, again, which control the free copper much better. So let me stop here and I can take any questions if you have any questions. We still have about five minutes or so. Peter, this is uh, Martin Brown. Thank you for that talk. That was uh, very timely because we've actually had several people who have not Wilson's disease but copper deficiency. And, yes. And uh, I'm wondering about the, the the testing that we'll usually – I order copper on pretty much everyone who has – definitely anyone who has a neuromyelopathy and, yes. and most people who have a just, – just have a neuropathy, polyneuropathy. Um, so if that's low, and I check a urine copper, and that is uh, also low, am I safe in in uh, treating them with copper? 
trying to replace their copper? Uh, or do I need to do the 24-hour urine? Am I missing something if I just do a random urine and find that they have a low copper level? Yes, yeah, so, so you know we can actually uh, you know again I've done a lot of work. Actually, you know I was the part of the story of denture cream, you know, which is kind of a took, took I was a, basically we are not never part of a lawsuit. We are just basically material witness. I was subpoenaed by Johnson, but not me, but in one of the university by Johnson and Johnson and uh, whoever it makes the other one. So it was a big headache. You know we did nothing wrong. We just told them this is you know poisoning people. But anyway, to your point. Uh, I think, you know, so I think that, you know, do uh, so here in the uh, actual, the actual um, uh, plasma copper can be potentially helpful, but I rely on a 24 hour copper, which gives him gives me better idea how low the copper is because, uh, and again, I, I don't do random urine. Of course, they, they would also measure that, but I typically would uh, rely on a 24 hour that can kind of give you a better idea of the overall copper. It's been, many times we really undetectable. Or less than five, you know, so so it gives you a better idea than, uh, you know, if you have a maybe 30, 40 uh, uh, copper value in plasma and you had a low seroplasm, you know, is it maybe somebody who is maybe heterozygote? So then that's why the other possibility would be that somebody's heterozygote, even though clinical picture is very typical, exactly myelo polyneuropathy. And so we're going to be published in a few, we took a few papers about that, mostly with the denture cream. Uh, and so, but again, I do, you're doing things right, I think, but I just would definitely proceed with the 24 hour copper, which is much more sensitive to overall copper homeostasis than, you know, just the spot, you know, random urine. And I remember actually, I think it was oh. Dr. Brown, the other Dr. Brown, if I remember correctly, who had a yes. case. Uh, and no, again, it's, again, it's, it's, actually, this is a very fascinating. Again, this, this would, this, the copper deficiency probably would deserve the whole another hour of talk, even though we had a few cases. So, and that was great pickup. And again, yeah, I agree that also like uh, copper would become this micronutrient when m many of us would check relatively routinely. And you know, you can you, you will detect these patients. You know, bariatric surgeries. Again, denture cream kind of went away a bit, but patients also take too many zinc uh, with the COVID. You know, some of them would take zinc for the COVID prophylaxis, so you can really poison yourself. So, so this still important thing about it. But a does a, a low twenty four hour urine copper level does that effectively rule out down? Um, how how likely is it to have Wilson's disease with a low twenty four hour? It's urine impossible. Copper? No, it's a, no no it's impossible. You know by definition it's more than hundred. So you know if you have that. That's why it's so useful. If it's low, with it, it Wilson disease, is 100 percent out. You know, there's absolutely no unless you know, unless somebody would you know if you have to assume that uh, collection and essay was done was done correctly. But if anything, I would force it positive. But, <laughs> correct. But no, if it if it's low, copper uh, Wilson disease is 100 percent out, million, million, million percent out. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And I can talk, you know, I can have a five talks about copper, but uh, I didn't want to do copper deficiency because we had a really very nice uh, case presentation, you know, again, a few months ago. It was really a great MRI. I remember the MRI as well. All right, so maybe it's for me time to round. Again, again, it's it's a zebra. It's out there. It's not a unicorn. Actually, it's most, maybe thoroughbred horse, which, of course, in Kentucky doesn't really work well because we have more thoroughbred horses than than regular horses here, you know, in the horse country. But again, it's out there, it exists, and copper is, you know, extremely important micronutrient. So, think, you know, I'm not saying order only copper, but uh, you don't want to miss it, as I said, kind of recapping that. Again, thanks so much, unless there's another question. Thanks so much for uh, joining us this morning. Thank you. All right, so we, I'll, we can start, stop sharing, I guess. Thank you.